One, two. Pasistengiu tą pelytą būtų slaidų. Ne, ne, čia daugiau nėra, bet jinai tiesiog gali nusistumti. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I think we might start now because we're already a little bit late. So thank you very much for coming to our FinTech and Tech Trends update because the first event we had in January, the next one is coming again in January, but we're going to talk about 2019. So I'm very happy that today we're going to have six speakers from Bank of Lithuania, Invest Lithuania, uh, from Revolut, from Deeper, from Deloyal, and from Baltic Sandbox, which is really amazing to have you guys here. So we're going to start from Bank of Lithuania and with the Ekaterina Govina presentation. Welcome on the stage. Hi. Uh, yeah, for, you, uh, for uh, those of you who don't now, uh, know me, uh, and uh, I think that uh, there are plenty uh, of such people, uh, so I'm Ekaterina, uh, I'm advising uh, uh, to Marius Jurgelas, uh, board member of the Bank of Lithuania, and uh, I'm also coordinating uh, fintech and uh, innovation strategy of the Bank of Lithuania. So today I will uh, talk uh, about uh, Bank of Lithuania role in fintech, uh, and um, uh, our initiatives uh, that uh, we will be working in uh, 2019 uh, that will take uh, most of our attention and uh, what is uh, maybe most important uh, for uh, fintechs uh, and uh, community of uh, um, innovators uh, in Lithuania. Uh, doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, be uh, before going uh, to uh, formal part, uh, uh, it couldn't uh, slip uh, from my attention that uh, something uh, has changed. Uh, and uh, the thing uh, uh, has changed, uh, actually, uh, is uh, the proportion of uh, women uh, on the uh, rise stage. Uh, last year, there were, uh, there were uh, six uh, men. And uh, this year, uh, I noticed uh, that uh, there are uh, three or four women uh, will be speaking. Uh, so as an uh, advocate uh, for women leadership, uh, uh, not only in financial sector, but uh, overall. So uh, I'm really glad uh, of uh, such trend. Uh, so thank you, Camille. Uh, so now going uh, to formal part. Uh, so uh, two years ago, uh, Bank of Lithuania uh, has approved uh, a new strategy for the year 2020. And uh, one of the direction uh, was uh, uh, to establish Bank of Lithuania uh, as a uh, financial sector uh, partner uh, that promotes uh, innovations and uh, sustainable growth. Uh, so two weeks ago, uh, our board, mem uh, board uh, met uh, uh, and uh, just wanted to, to reconsider uh, whether we are uh, moving in the right direction. So the answer was yes. Uh, so we are continuing uh, uh, to uh, work on initiatives uh, that uh, helps the uh, financial, uh, uh, financial sector uh, to be more innovative. Uh, and our commitments, uh, I could uh, uh, group them uh, in such a way. Uh, so first of all, uh, we uh, want to guide, uh, uh, to be more like a guide doc, uh, not a watchdog of financial sector. Uh, second thing, uh, thing uh, we want to accelerate uh, uh, innovations uh, in financial uh, sector. And the third one, uh, which is the uh, most uh, complicated one, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, to set example to be example by ourselves, not only to require a financial market uh, to be innovative one, but uh, be, be innovative uh, one uh, by ourselves. Uh, 
So yeah, first uh, guide. Um, uh, so uh, two years ago, we uh, launched a, a newcomer program. Uh, we uh, have a dedicated project manager for newcomer uh, program uh, that uh, helps uh, uh, newcomers uh, to financial market uh, uh, to understand uh, what uh, are our expectations uh, and uh, what are requirements uh, for uh, such type of uh, business. Um, uh, up to date, uh, we received about uh, 250 uh, requests uh, for meeting uh, or conference call. Uh, and we proceed them uh, quite successfully. Uh, so um, uh, it proves that uh, this in initiative uh, was uh, uh, really uh, helpful and uh, market uh, needs uh, it. Uh, second thing, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, important now and will be important, I think, in 2019, uh, it is security ICO. Uh, because last year it was uh, all about utility. Uh, and uh, now I think uh, nobody doubts uh, that uh, security ICO is uh, the future. Uh, so what uh, we are trying to do, uh, we are trying uh, to understand uh, by ourselves uh, um, how security ICO uh, fits uh, within the uh, current uh, 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 legislation. And uh, we try to uh, explain market, uh, financial market participants, uh, because uh, they are afraid uh, and they uh, do not want to risk uh, going in such an uh, undefined uh, field. Uh, so we are trying uh, to, uh, I just put this you know, scheme just uh, to prove that we are working on that, uh, but it's only draft uh, and you shouldn't uh, follow these uh, uh, steps. Uh, it's just uh, uh, trying uh, to say you that uh, we uh, plan to issue some guidance uh, for market uh, how to issue security ICO in a right way. Uh, second block uh, is uh, acceleration. Uh, just yesterday we announced uh, that we open regulatory sandbox. Uh, that means that uh, uh, fintech companies or even incumbents uh, that wants uh, to launch uh, some innovative product and uh, that are not sure uh, whether this product uh, fits within uh, regulation, uh, they can apply for regulatory sandbox. Uh, uh, present their business model and uh, to try uh, this uh, solution or financial product uh, in a limited uh, space uh, with the limited number of uh, customers. Uh, what we will do, uh, we will uh, uh, make sure that we won't apply sanctions uh, if something uh, goes wrong uh, and uh, we will help uh, innovators uh, uh, to go through uh, regulatory requirements just to consult and explain uh, how their business model uh, should, be, uh, should operate. And the uh, second example of uh, acceleration of uh, innovations is uh, LB Chain. Uh, Lithuanian uh, bank uh, chain, uh, uh, our huge pro uh, project uh, that uh, we are quite extensively working right now. Uh, so again, uh, very complicated uh, uh, picture, uh, but just uh, uh, to, to again prove that we are working on that. And we are working on this uh, uh, platform, uh, which is a platform for blockchain solutions, uh, where uh, fintech is uh, that uh, are building uh, any uh, financial services or IT tools uh, based on blockchain uh, can come to us uh, and use our uh, technological uh, base uh, for uh, uh, prototypes uh, and um, uh, for testing uh, uh, their solutions. And now we are working on this project, uh, project uh, together with uh, four companies, uh, IBM, Deloitte, uh, Tieto and uh, Intec. So uh, basically we are, what we are doing, we are doing R&D uh, that uh, we really hope uh, will end uh, in the uh, middle or uh, at the end of the next year. And uh, then uh, we will see uh, and I hope that we will present this uh, uh, technological platform for, uh, for, for companies. And the last block, I think I need to finish. Yes. Doesn't work again. Oh, no. Yeah. And yes, a uh, sad example uh, uh, for uh, some of you, uh, uh, nothing is new, uh, it's uh, old news already. Uh, uh, about half uh, a year ago, uh, our um, uh, Godfather, as we called uh, him, uh, uh, board member Marius Jurgiles, uh, uh, he came uh, uh, in office, uh, it was, uh, I think, after his holidays, uh, and he said, uh, uh, let's issue digital collector coin. 
it was something really crazy idea. It sounded uh, like a crazy idea uh, at that moment uh, because uh, all uh, society, uh, all people are used that uh, collector coins, uh, they uh, should have a physical, uh, physical uh, presence. Uh, but we uh, started uh, to uh, elaborate on this idea and uh, uh, after three months we organized the uh, first uh, hackathon uh, organized by the Bank of Lithuania where we uh, invited uh, uh, blockchain companies uh, uh, to come and uh, to present their view how this digital collector coin should look like. So now we are in the pro process of uh, pub uh, commercial uh, uh, procurement process and uh, uh, we hope that in 2019 we will uh, uh, make, uh, uh, make it uh, uh, live. Uh, uh, so every one of you will have the chance uh, to buy digital collector coin, uh, first of this kind uh, in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, by this uh, project we also hope uh, to get uh, um, understanding uh, of uh, blockchain technology and uh, how digital, uh, dig digital coins uh, issued by central bank uh, uh, could uh, work. And yes, and uh, the, the last slide, uh, sorry. Yeah, the last slide, uh, I started that uh, we want to be more like uh, uh, guide dogs and watchdog, but we still, we are committed uh, to market. We want uh, that market uh, uh, operates well. Um, so there is example of uh, our uh, uh, recent uh, fine, uh, more than uh, 1 million euro that was applied uh, for companies that uh, didn't uh, um, comply uh, with anti-money laundering um, regulation. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody, <laughs> it's just uh, to show that, uh, uh, yes, we want to be open, uh, uh, we encourage market uh, to come and uh, talk uh, with us, uh, but uh, if uh, companies don't want uh, to uh, comply with the regulation, we act uh, uh, quite uh, hard, I don't know. So yes, that's all from my side, uh, uh, thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? There are any questions? I wanted to throw this one, so please, at least one question. <laughs> okay, fine. If you will have questions, Yakaterina will be here, so you can ask her during the networking event. And now I'd like to invite Dominikas from Invest Lithuania, and he has something special prepared for you. Something special was the presentation that it's not turning out. Okay, here we go. Yes, my contact details is something special. We can start from that. Let's see, boom, boom, boom. Perfect, you know all the presentation from, from the end. Uh, okay, so my name is Dominikas. I'm a FinTech investment advisor at the government agency in West Lithuania. Today I wanna talk uh, about the global trends uh, and I want to present why I think the little country of Lithuania is there and why we're shining in the global fintech uh, block. So, as I said, I'm going to start with the global trends. Uh, what we hear from the market is Asia is catching up so, so fast in the fintech space. And this graph, which shows uh, fintech investments uh, in, by the regions, by the continents, and you can see that the Asia is coming up really fast and they're almost surpassing the US market. What is interesting that European Union is, is, is quite, uh, quite still uh, with their investments. I'll talk uh, why is that so a little bit later. But I wanna po point out that the emerging markets, Africa, uh, South America are also seeing a lot of new innovation and I wanna encourage you to explore those markets as well. So, as of today, uh, we have 29 fintech unicorns uh, globally. You can see the, the pictures and the logos and the, the countries they're coming from. Uh, accumulated wealth of the unicorns is 84 billion uh, US dollars, which is, shows a lot of uh, potential and growth in the sector. And in the first part of this year, uh, seven new unicorns were, were given birth, so to, so to say. Revolut is, is among them, so I'm, I'm happy that Revolut is here. We do not have any unicorns coming from the Baltic states, but we have uh, one that came to Lithuania, so I'm quite happy about that. 
What is more interesting is that the number of uh, M&As and IPOs is still increasing quite rapidly, and I think it shows the ability and hungriness of, of the market for, for new ideas. Uh, incumbents, they're charging back. Uh, we see that a lot of banks are, are putting up fintech strategies. They're not uh, you know, waiting for fintechs to disrupt their business models. They have a lot of capital. They do not have maybe the most innovative uh, teams on their side, but they're investing a lot. In the US, we saw a lot of capital market in, uh, related investments. So a lot of banks want to invest in new startups that are working in the capital market. In Europe and US, we saw a lot of investment in point of sale devices. So basically banks are integrated uh, vertically in supply chain. Airfree and Corda is probably my most favorite blockchain company. They're uniting most of the big banks. They're working on the system that would uh, allow banks to make payments in an easier way using blockchain technology. So I think this, this trend uh, shows that increments are charging back as well. And the PSD2 has pushed a lot of commercial banks in Europe to invest a lot of in infrastructure in the open banking and, and APIs. So Europe is still lacking behind. You saw that from, from the graph. I think there are four main reasons. The first one is Brexit. There's still a lot of uncertainties related to that question. A lot of topics need to, a lot of questions need to be answered and uh, it still causes investors some headache. What we hear from our clients is that a lot of investors are coming to the board meetings and are saying, guys, uh, March, Next year, we're gonna have the deadline. Do you have the plan B? Is there a plan B? So a lot of these companies now are pushed to think uh, outside of UK what they're gonna do after Brexit. Of course, it's uncertainty. We do not have clear answers yet, but uncertainty causes a lot of trouble for, for the FinTech businesses. There is also a massive de-risking de happening in the European Union, meaning that commercial banks are throwing out uh, risky clients from their portfolio. So it challenges the whole ecosystem because it can cut the fintech access to, to the uh, financial systems. There is no crowd, crowdfunding, a unified crowdfunding regulatory environment. So as we have one for payments and e-money license, so basically you can passport the license from Lithuania, throughout the Europe, you cannot do that with the crowdfunding. And that's also a major, major challenge for the crowdfunding and P2P lending companies. And partnerships, Compared to US, compared to China, Europe is still lacking in that field. We need to partner up with other countries. We need to partner up with uh, other companies because FinTech is, is quite unique in this field. Without partnerships, you cannot do anything uh, in this sector. So going back to Lithuania, uh, together with RISE, uh, last year we've done uh, the, the survey of the local FinTech uh, companies. We're gonna renew that at the end of this year. The most spectacular number for me is 43% yearly growth rate in 2017 of, of the sector. And uh, I think today we can uh, say confidently that more than 2,000 people are working in the sector. And our goal, as you see this map, I wanted to put this, is, is to attract companies from all over the world to come to Lithuania, to use Lithuania as a gateway to the European market to create some jobs here, to create partnership opportunities. And for me personally, I'm, I'm really happy to see that those companies that are coming here are bringing a lot of new opportunities, a lot of new partnerships. There were a lot of contracts signed, uh, exports are growing as well. Companies are, are working together with companies from all over the world. So I think this is, this is really beneficial for our market as well. A lot of uh, you might have known this. I just wanted to say what we hear from, again, from investors when they come here. Basically, as I said, the electronic money institution and payment license can be passported throughout the European market. You cannot get that in uh, Asia. You cannot get that in US. We have a unique chance to have a global business from one country with one license that would serve more than 500 million customers. How cool is that? You, we should use this opportunity and enter the European market and grow the local startups from our ecosystem. You saw the regulator, uh, Yekaterina presented quite, quite a few things. I think the, there are a lot of in initiatives like the fastest licensing procedure, challenger bank licenses, sandbox, remote KYC, newcomers program, all the documents could be submitted in English. It's unique. I haven't heard any country said that the initiative, the FinTech initiative, came from the regulator. And this is what is unique about Lithuania. And this proactiveness, this 
uh, I would say, need to, to collaborate is, is really unique, I would say, globally. Then the, the infrastructure part, UK is only testing this now with TransferWise. Lithuania has the central link for, for two years now. So it's been a unique solution and the companies that come here, they do not understand it at first, but when they grasp the opportunities that it brings, it allows them to, to move forward. The blockchain sandbox I think is also gonna be an interesting one. Yekaterina told about that. The fourth, the last, but not least uh, of our value proposition as, as, uh, as we like to say is, is the, our talent pool. We have the talent pool today. The, we have a talent pool that speaks really good English. We have the talent pool that is capable of speaking more than two uh, foreign languages. And we're working on three dimensions in order to increase the talent pool. So one is universities. Uh, maybe you saw that Vilnius Gediminas Technical University has launched FinTech Masters program. They're looking for, for collaborations with businesses, so you know, feel free to approach them. We're working to bring back our diaspora. Uh, we're working to bring back people who left Lithuania, who have international skills, who, who have international experience at the companies. We want to bring them back to Lithuania. We want to create jobs that uh, would be global, that would be challenging, and that would be well paid in Lithuania. And the third part, we have to admit we're a small country, we're an aging society, and we have to bring talent to our country. We're in a unique position to bring non-EU talent since Belarus, Russia, Ukraine is so close by. It's way better uh, feeling for them to go here where a lot of people can still speak Russian than to go to London where they feel completely lost. So this is a unique opportunity that we're trying to use as well. So a lot of companies have managed to use Lithuanian talent pool and, and build solutions and benefit uh, their shareholders. What we like to say that the Lithuanian talent is, is hungry to innovate. We heard a lot of stories that companies are operating here and they're saying, these guys, I love them, the Lithuanians, they come to work, they have a manual task, they find a way to uh, make the task be done by, by the automatic processes, they come to the, their boss and they said, I don't have any work to do, I've, uh, I've created an algor algorithm that is solving my problem. And this is quite unique, trust me. And the quality to cost ratio that we get here is still really, really attractive for, uh, for our investors. So we as Invest Lithuania, just, just briefly to mention, we're attracting foreign companies to establish here in, in, in Lithuania. I'm, I'm specifically working with the FinTech sector. We're helping them to, to start their operations here. We're happy to collaborate with the venture capitalists, with the associations and, and various uh, industry bodies. Uh, and uh, basically, I, I wanted to use this chance to, to encourage you all to spread the message about Lithuania, the new kid on the block. And I think that working together, we can achieve something big, and that will be written in our history. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. I heard that uh, during Japan delegation, it was such a Lovely presentation. So thanks for bringing it here to Rice Vilnius. Do you have any questions? Yeah, finally. No. Do we have more questions? Okay, now I'm presenting Yeva from Revolut and she thinks that FinTech is a bacteria. So let's hear what's that. How much time do I have again? 15? 20? 15 minutes. 15, okay, let me put the timer. So hi, good evening everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm very happy to be here and to speak. And yes, today I am going to talk about why I think that FinTech is the best bacteria of the 21st century and why we should all, in fact, try to get infected as fast as we can. So I don't assume that, you know, a, a, like a typical person would know a lot about bacteria, but if there's one thing that everybody knows, it's this. The five-second rule. 
does it? Yeah, not really collaborative, <laughs> sorry. So basically, yeah, everything you know, uh, we typically know about bacteria is that if you drop a piece of food on the ground and it doesn't stay on it longer than, than for five seconds, then it's still okay to eat it. So you know, it's been passed on for, for generations. Um, apparently, the bacteria doesn't really think that way, as the scientific proof here shows. Um, so bacteria has no plan of growth, but it has a goal. So a goal is basically to survive and to grow and to dominate whatever organism or whatever space uh, it's inhabiting. By saying that it doesn't have a plan, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, it doesn't think that, you know, I'm going to take a left turn here or a right turn there, and this is how I'm going to get to to the goal, this is how I'm going to grow. No, it basically just, you know, sees what's happening in the space and moves around it in a certain way. And there's, you know, another player in the, a player in the market that is operating that way. And it's fintech companies. And Revolut essentially is also growing by applying the same model and, and the same patterns. And so in my speech, I'm going to talk about why, you know, even though, you know, the bacteria uh, model of growth may not sound very appetizing, why it's actually the best way that, you know, a company can grow in, in um, today's sector, in, in the financial world, in the banking sector that, that we see today, and why it's actually one of the biggest benefits that we as fintech, as new challenger banks have against the incumbents. So speaking about the, you know, the, the steps, the model of the growth. So like I said, the bacteria does not have a step-by-step -step plan of what's it, you know, what it's going to do in order to grow. So basically it moves in the space based on you know, what chemical stimulus is you know, affecting it. So if there's poison or if there's danger, it just kind of you know, shifts away from it. If there's food somewhere, if it sees that, you know, that's the opportunity for me to, to go grab it and grow, it just goes for that. So basically, like I said, the goal is to survive and to grow, and it moves around by you know, whatever is affecting it at the moment. And essentially, this is you know, what a lot of fintech startups are, are doing as well. Uh, <laughs> may sound a little scary, sounds definitely counterintuitive, because you know, this is not what we were taught in schools, that's not what they taught us in universities. Uh, that's not how the big corporations and the incumbent banks work. Because typically, you're used to hearing that, well, you have a goal, you have this vision, so please present to me the entire plan of how you're going to get there. The step-by-step -step plan, all the players that are going to be in charge of every step, all the other players that you know, you're going to have to report back to, all the analysis, all the hierarchy, all the layers of decision making, and there you go, there you have this huge bubble of decision makers, of people you have to report back to, and this you know, is in our eyes what creates an incumbent bank. So basically, this is also how you know, Revolut started in essence. You know, we saw that in the space that you know, we were, in, in the banking sector, there were three main you know, um, dangers or, or poisons or things that we wanted to avoid. So uh, we saw that the status quo in the banking sector was that the system that the incumbent banks were providing for was expensive, inconvenient, and pretty sneaky. So basically, our goal was to navigate the services and navigate the user away from these three, three poisons into a, a, um, a, a banking kind of, um, into a way of banking that is you know, radically better than, than it is today. And so when you set that goal, so when you're, at kind of, you know, we as Revolut, for example, we were a bacteria in a sense, you know, in an organism that was already existing because, you know, you have this whole banking system that has been, sorry, that has been around for, you know, thousands of years. And here we are, just, you know, a company that was established in 2015 saying that they're somehow going to disrupt the entire banking system. So obviously, you know, when you're this small bacteria, you have to get viral to, to create this change. So going viral, you know, in essence, it's pretty simple. If you have a good product that sells itself, you know, you're good to go. So basically create a good product and then profit from it. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to work in a company where, yeah, we, we do have a good product that really gets people excited enough to want to talk about it to the others. Um, so if you start with that, you're, you know, you're in a really good starting position. Um, by that, you know, the, the technological innovations that we introduce, they also bring new paradigms of um, design and kind of a shift in, um, in perception of how people see banking and how people see 
uh, way of going about their finances. So, you know, when we speak about uh, new paradigms in design, you know, it's things starting with, you know, the design of the card, the design of the packaging of the card that we've all seen on Instagram, you know, people pulling in and tossing the, the Revolut packaging. Um, then it's the app, it's all the user experience on the app that it's creating and how it's transforming your, your experiences um, in, uh, with your financial, um, uh, with the way you handle your finance. And if you have those things, if you have a product that is creating something new, that is recreating and reshaping, you know, um, people's customs and, and what, they're, what they're used to do, then you really are on the path to, to exponential growth. Uh, in our case, you can really see how that happens uh, kind of in this um, uh, graph. So, like I said, Revolut was launched in 2015, and we acquired our first million uh, users in two and a half years. And then the second million users uh, was acquired in the next six months. So you can really tell that, you know, after the first million was there, the growth really, you know, started picking up kind of, a, you know, a hockey uh, stick sort of shape. Um, because naturally, the more people you have talking about you, uh, you know, the bigger, the, um, you know, the bigger spread of the word is. And so now we're approaching, uh, well, we're, I think we're, yeah, today we're over 2.8 2 million users. So in three years, with zero paid marketing, just with having, a, you know, bacterial viral kind of product that people are excited enough to speak about, this is, you know, how, how we managed to do it. So apparently, um, the system works. Sorry. So a couple of examples to illustrate that I'm not just, you know, making up the stuff about not having a clear step-by-step -step plan, but just listening to what the market needs. So one of the examples is also one of uh, our most successful features that we've ever launched is the crypto offering on the app. So with it, uh, you essentially got, you know, the, the fastest way in the market, you know, to get exposure to cryptocurrencies. So three years ago, when the company was launched, nobody had the idea of doing that. Um, our co-founder was not into uh, cryptocurrencies at all. He, he did not ha have any plans of offering anything like that. And then uh, probably a year and a half after, you know, launching Revolut, I think he was in Minsk. And um, he said that, you know, a cab driver started talking to him uh, about Bitcoin. And that was, you know, kind of the light bulb moment when he understood that, you know, that's how mainstream Bitcoin was. So if it's that mainstream, apparently the market, the pool of people that are interested in has to be fairly big. So apparently that could be fairly profitable as well, you know, if you find a way to, to monetize it. And yeah, we did. So essentially, like I said, this was never in the original plan that, you know, this was something that we're going to do. Because as many of you know, Revolut just started, you know, as a travel card and an app that had, you know, free currency exchange. Uh, so again, that's, you know, one of the examples of how as a fintech, you're able to just listen to the market, uh, see, you know, where the best growth potential is and kind of, you know, shift yourself that way. Another example, is a commission-free trading platform that we are currently building. So hopefully it's gonna be launched within this year. Um, so the same way we disrupted banking, that's the way we're hoping to disrupt investments as well. So um, if any of you have tried the crypto offering on the app, that's a lot like how the trading is gonna work as well. So in just a couple of um, buttons, you're gonna be able to buy and sell stocks, bonds, and ETFs. Um, if the, well, the stocks of the UK and, and US listed uh, companies for, for starters. And so, again, this is not something that, you know, the company was thinking about doing when it was launched. Because, again, it was just a travel card, a, pre a prepaid travel card in the app. But then, again, you see that, you know, step two was actually thinking of building this platform with several partners. And we were already in negotiations and that was, you know, in process. But then we backed out of it again, and the final decision was to create everything in-house. So even in that process, you saw that, you know, there were several um, different steps of how we got to, to this decision. And well, again, we just saw that, you know, the market is there. It's not being offered by anyone else. And we just, I guess, you know, got enough confidence by now to think that we can do it. So yeah, fingers crossed. So some of the risks that I think um, are kind of, you know, 
sort of trendy risks in the market now that you know um, startups like us should be and are um, trying to work around. So the first one of them is the gener generational change, and you know th that applies to the users, the employees, and the employers. So by now we already have more than 30% uh, of the workforce. You know, more than 30% of the workforce is millennials. Generation Z is entering. Um, the market as as new employees and generations that to me it's just a completely different world like uh, with their attention span and with their understanding of the world and with their desires you know they're a, a just this completely new pool of you know users that you have to um, kind of customize your product to so think that those people are not only you know increasingly uh, making up a larger part of the user base, but they're also you know becoming your employees, and the employers you know are, are millennials and they're also getting younger, and that you know is bringing so many changes in, in the mindset of how you organize your work, of how you you look for people, of how the people are you know looking for for work. That is something that you know a lot of a lot of companies are, are struggling with. Revolut is having a really hard time hiring people, actually. Um, when I joined, I think we were, well, it's not gonna sound like that from the numbers, of course. When, when I joined, we were about 100 people. Uh, there are 500 in the company now, and the plan is to have 800 by the end of the year. So we're hiring you know, 10 to 15 people every week in, in all of the countries. Um, and yeah, I say it is a challenge because it should be happening faster. Um, because of you know the the speed that we're scaling, but it's hard because you know uh, people are are looking for so many more different things today when they're looking for a job. It's not you know only about the pay. It's also about the you know the the philosophy, the psychology, the climate, the the coffee um, in the office, and and all that. The global competition for talent is something that's reshaping hiring massively as well, because you know if we are no longer you know re restricted geographically. Like if I'm in Venice, it does not mean that I'm only applying for for job in companies that are based in Venice. So the competition is global, and you know it's happening on on all the so social media channels via various referral programs. Uh, the digital, digital nomads is just another class, you know, that, that is sh kind of changing the, the market as well. And then the regulation is, well, it's not a risk per se, but it's something as well that, you know, um, is happening, you know, hand in hand with all the developments that are taking place in the fintech sector. So, uh, of course, typically when you speak about sandboxes, you think of, you know, Singapore or, or Australia or UK, Lithuania as of now. So, so you know, we're happy about that. So. Uh, for some time, you know, a lot of regulators were sort of just trying to catch up with what was, what was happening. And it's, well, uh, of course it causes some risks, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, I wouldn't say, because, you know, that just shows progress. And, you know, progress is always better than any stagnation. So regulation is definitely shifting, and especially when um, the fintechs are going global. So before the end of the year, we're expecting to launch in the U.S., and mostly all the delay has been caused because of regulation. Because in Europe, yeah, we have it easy, like the, um, you know, the Monica said, which is how one regulator and you know, the services can be passported in other countries. In the US, you have to comply with each state regulator and then you know, like 10 more on top, I think. So that is one of the biggest challenges in scaling and that's one of the um, you know, main things that are slowing the growth down. Uh, whereas the opportunities or, you know, those things that we as a bacteria are kind of trying to glide towards um, are sort of, you know, strange in a way because uh, they cover two very different ends of the spectrum. So on one side, you're speaking about things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, automated learning, you know, all computers and all data and, and, and all numbers. On the other side of the spectrum, you're speaking about, you know, imagination, creativity, uh, human talent, uh, communities, something that is very, well, human. <laughs> and I think, you know, finding the perfect balance to that is essentially what is going to, you know, drive us to, to this fascinating future where we're headed to. So when I say building communities, what I mean is, again, you know, the virality of the product. Because um, if you have a product that your users, your community is excited about, then they essentially do all the work, all the marketing work for you. Um, until 
July, uh, this, uh, this year, July, August, we didn't have a single person working for Revolut in um, Scandinavia. And somehow in Sweden, for example, we already had 20, 20,000 users, I think. We have no idea how that happened. Like we, we did not, you know, do anything proactively. So it was just all, you know, people talking about it to others, referring it. And that means that, you know, we did something right in creating the product because people are excited to share it. So community is, you know, is something that also helps, um, helps the FinTech scale. Uh, another opportunity and, you know, another kind of um, useful thing to, to, to bear in mind is sort of related to the generation, generational change that I mentioned before. Uh, so the changing business models that are uh, largely brought about, you know, because of the changing generations and because of the changing perceptions um, of how businesses are conducted because the companies now are so international and they're so scattered around the, the world. So, you know, you have your headquarters in London, then you have your Baltics office in Reis Vilnius, uh, two seats at a table, and then, you know, and, and it's a company. So that's basically, um, it's very flexible and it, it presents so many different opportunities that have not been around before. And like I said before, the artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence combined with human creativity is something that, you know, will bring about just some fascinating changes, I believe, because with artificial intelligence, uh, you basically, you know, you can do so many good things. You can drive the price down. You can um, make all of the processes so much more efficient and faster and uh, more accurate, uh, not prone to human error and, you know, all those kinds of things. And at the same time, you can utilize all the human creativity that has, you know, the imagination to deal with the data that is computed, that is, you know, collected by the machines. And so when you have that and add it with the creativity, I think, you know, this is going to have some, some pretty uh, amazing results because essentially creativity and imagination are the two skills that, you know, you cannot put into a machine. So the future vision, the global mobile banking that we're talking about. So, you know, when we say that we're working towards becoming a first truly global bank, you may think that, well, we already have global banks in the world. Like, you know, you have your headquarters in London and then you have all the departments in all the other countries. Well, that's not what we mean. So by global banking, we mean that no matter where you're coming from and no matter what passport you hold, wherever you go, you should have um, the possibility to open a local current account on your phone in less than two minutes. So basically, that's the vision that with Revolut, for example, you're you know, uh, um, an Australian traveling in Italy. You come to Italy, you open Revolut, and you can open up your um, current account on, on the phone in less than two minutes. Um, you can have the multi-currency accounts. Uh, the future is all about full control of your accounts and cards on the phone. It's about safe transactions online. It's about spending, budgeting control, and savings. It's about investment, like I said, in a couple of minutes on your phone and free instant transfers globally. So that's, you know, coming back to our hope and plan to, to launch in the States by the end of the year because that will virtually make us the first service provider in the world that will give you a chance to transfer money across the Atlantic Ocean for free and instantly. So that's like, you know, bringing Tesla to the moon. Um, then if we go back to the, uh, you know, title of, of this... Um, talk that's a little too long already. Um, why is FinTech the best bacteria of the 21st century? Well, I think it, it's best because, you know, of how agile innovators are able to find the best fitting solutions to all the unique needs that are out there and to cover all the niche um, clients and all the niche um, clientele. So it's not about mass product, like kind of one size fits all anymore. It's about how technology helps us, you know, customize uh, everything, every, you know, service, every tool that we offer and make it truly convenient, cheap, fast, comfortable, understandable, and well, customer centric, essentially, nicely put. And that is all I have to say. So thank you for listening. Do we have questions for Yeva now, or you can keep it for later on? So if not, thank you very much, Yeva. You can come anytime. She's always here at Trice. Yeah, so <laughs> we, 
more Revolut cards. She has lots of boxes, so if you need Revolut, just apply to her. And now we're going to hear a little bit different presentation from Deeper. Uh, Ronald Rolandes is going to talk about uh, marketing in tech. So I believe it's going to be really interesting. Thanks for taking all my time, Revolut. Okay, so I came from another company, which is Adipa, the most innovative company in Lithuania. I like to brag about that. Who, who can check out there? So uh, today's, uh, today's uh, topic, let me go back, is about marketing technologies, which we use instead of the fintech. I, after listening to you, I'm thinking I'm more lucky to work in this uh, category. <laughs> Uh, so, what do we have technologies in today's world in the marketing? Um, first of all, I want to say that the, the landscape, the marketing is really evolving and we have so many technologies now uh, and if most of the marketers, you know, feel so empowered like, like Indian goddesses, you know, with lots of hands, we can do everything. Uh, every single day, you know, I get um, like tens of the emails from different um, like technology companies saying, Rolandas, our technology can help you with 200 uh, ROE increase, and others even more. Then my sales director in our company sends me, Rolandas, check this technology. Then our CEO sends to me, look at this technology. You know, like there are plenty, so many of the technologies which can help. And they're saying they, they will do my work, you know, more effective, more efficient, and so on. So I've tried to collect you know, some examples in real life where there are some creative solutions and some technologies behind to show you what we can do in today's life. So the first mega trend uh, of the marketing in 2018 and 2019 is a video actually. Uh, believe it or not, is there something better than the video? It was for you know, 10, what, 50 years or something like that on the market. Uh, maybe less a little bit, uh, but uh, Today, the video has some uh, new technologies in the back end, and these technologies, uh, we call them uh, uh, immersive videos. That means there is like a 3D surrounding, giving you some extra uh, totally different engagement and understanding of the environment, and we have 360 degree videos, we have augmented reality, and we have uh, virtual reality. And of course, behind all of these videos, you know, there are like these technologies. So I've picked a few of the uh, solutions, uh, examples um, of few of the companies which are using this and this is one of the uh, airlines which had uh, simple uh, advertising you know on on maybe it's even on the GDN network uh, which had 360 videos simple 360 videos of how you may feel in the first class on the airlines and they had 35 times more effective you know communication uh, and engagement in that ad than on the traditional 2D. Uh, the Red Bull had, uh, with the help of the Honda, they had an event where instead of inviting everyone with a, uh, traditional you know, ways and communication, they created a 360 video. So how does it really look and feels to be inside the racing car? And they had one of the most successful uh, uh, events uh, which they had. Um, another example, you know, uh, you all most of you might know Thomas Cook, the um, international travel agency. So they had uh, virtual reality headsets shipped to 10 of the, the retail networks, retail stores, uh, and they had a virtual reality tour with a helicopter in the New York. So in all of those 10 um, retail stores, they had almost 200 percentage uh, of these uh, travel suggestions. So imagine that, very simple technology, very simple, you know, you have one special camera, you film it, and you have 200 increase, only by changing the technology. The second trend, which is as well in the video, which is happening now, it's uh, live streaming. So all of the social networks have live streaming now, starting from Facebook to YouTube and others. And we're talking now about not a simple live streaming, but about professional live streaming. There are applications, there are tools which gives you a really good quality, you know, and interesting uh, live streaming. And why live streaming? Um, this year, when you're looking at the year of year growth, uh, how is live streaming doing? So it's growing more than 100 percentage when the older ones, you know, are only picking up. 
Why long stream, uh, live stream? Uh, because uh, somehow people feel more engaged, they uh, feel they can do better, they are more excited, they are more involved with the brand when we have the live streaming. And of course, uh, why the live streaming is better than others? Because during the live streaming, sorry for fasting so fast, talking so fast, thanks again, Revolut. So um, they do a lot of, you know, texting, they, uh, they engage on the social, and they do even search, quite a lot of search, while watching live stream. Uh, and the second mega trend, uh, <laughs> oh my god, I need to drink something. So the second mega trend is uh, our augmented reality, which, uh, uh, which exploded even more, and they went from the video to actually all of the profiles. Uh, so you all know there is a game, uh, the Pokemon, which has the exploded, sorry, thank you, which had exploded this year. Uh, there is another app which called IKEA Place, so basically the retail network with the help of IKEA Place uh, uh, application at home with the help of virtual reality, you know, augmented reality, you can uh, check how your uh, furniture will look uh, at your house. Uh, another one, uh, American Airlines, they have an application which uh, literally uh, navigates you to the gates uh, and other stores inside the airport. And there is another one, uh, Monster Park, so simple game which you took to any of the park and uh, you have dinosaurs at uh, any of the, uh, even Lithuanian parks if you wish. So the technology gives you quite a lot of, you know, solutions how to go more creatively. The third one, influence and marketing. Uh, if you see the mega trend is huge, all of the, all of the companies are thinking where to put the money and everyone is now betting on the influence marketing, even though there is a rumor that influence marketing is going actually to collapse. At least to collapse the part of uh, unmeasurable influence and marketing as the companies are putting billions and billions you know, of, of, the, of, uh, of the dollars in that market, you know, everyone started to ask, you know, can we start measuring that? And now the first change is, of course, on the biggest influence market uh, and the biggest uh, social network, which is uh, Instagram. They created a Instagram Stack Business Partner feature, which allows to put a tag that this is actually an advertising instead of simple, you know, post. Uh, what does that give? Firstly, that gives some really good analytical data, both for the advertiser and for the influencer. Unfortunately, at the moment, people don't really see that. They don't understand what some of the tags means. But um, the point, the other point actually is that there are a lot of money in the, the social network which is going no to the social network itself, Facebook, uh, but it goes to the influencers. So the rumor is the guys actually want to take part of the money and this is how they are checking, you know, they want to get more of the data, maybe to put some their ads behind or after on the feed of this or maybe in the future even to start filtering, you know, the exposure of these kind of the ads as they did with the business profiles and now none of the business can actually, without investments, show any of the, you know, uh, content on their profiles to the followers. Next one, next one. So Amazon also decided to join the influence and marketing and they launched the, uh, the new platform where all the YouTube stars can join in and everyone gets a piece out of the sales. And um, with the help of the e-commerce, finally, you know, there is a few ways how actually to track it. We have different comments, we have links, we have uh, discount codes um, and a tracking pixels. So step by step, the influence, uh, influence marketing is becoming more trackable and that's because of the technology. Next, so the fourth one is customer journey. Uh, I believe you, most of you have seen the traditional, you know, customer journey from awareness stage to the loyalty stage. But what is happening, you know, never before we had so many different touch points, you know, with the uh, customer when he's visiting some of our uh, places. Is it a before purchase, during purchase or after the purchase? So we get a really a lot of data, you know, from different technologies in our data warehouses. What's happening then, you know, with the data and knowing everything about a person, we're starting to talk about the fifth mega trend, which is, which is personalization. And I'm not talking about simple personalization. You know, most of you think like 
personalization, which is email. You know, you send an email with the first name, which you take out of the database. But when we're talking about full personalization, we're taking, talking about you send a personal email to the someone with his name and the content special for him, then you land him to the personalized uh, homepage. When he's on the website, you get personalized uh, interior pages or product pages. If he purchase or if he wants to purchase something, you get him a special discount only for him. And when he purchases, you ship it because you already know his address, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a full scale of personalization on all of the sales funnel. What's next? So when you have all of this amazing personalization and data and so on, we are talking about next mega trend, which is uh, online meets the offline. And uh, some of you already know, some of you know, we're talking about the omnichannel. So, Finally, retail you know, gets a lot of data from your digital world and you can join both of these networks with the simplest things like you watch on IKEA store you know, um, any of the virtual uh, furniture, you order it online and you can pick up it in a simple retail store or you ask the guys you know, to come and install it to here. So that's one of the simplest way you know, how both of the worlds join. Um, we all heard about, you know, Amazon, like the biggest online player is actually opening some of the uh, retail stores. So personalization, data, full understanding of the omni-channel, again, that's because of technology and so on. When I'm talking about what I've talked before, uh, then it's data and it's understanding of uh, uh, personal opinion. But sometimes when you don't have actually the data, we're talking about external world which you can personalize to someone. So now we're talking to the, coming to the seventh, uh, which is a native ads. So now we have the technology. If someone comes to, to the website or if someone is searching you know, on simple Google, uh, the ads looks like it is a native uh, content. And it's really difficult, you know, to understand: is it a content or is it, a, is it, is it, is it an ad? Sometimes it's a trickery, and sometimes most of the websites do allow to do that. Um, another, another one is a content. So after the GDPR, uh, this May, uh, suddenly all of our email databases had to be deleted. Uh, all of our cookies had to be deleted. And now everyone is coming back to the old uh, ways, and that is a content. And uh, there are a lot of actually now agencies which uh, stopped using the uh, programmatics and, uh, uh, because they don't have enough of the data, and they went back to the content. So people reading the content, you more know less what kind of the content, and you put your ad next to the content. So this is other one. And uh, two more left. The voice commerce. So as you all know, all of the big players now has a, uh, let's say, call them assistants. Uh, you have them at home. You have them, most of you have them at home. And all of these assistants are always on. They're always listening to whatever you're doing. They're always waiting for some of your commands. Uh, and from this market, it's expecting billions and billions, you know, in, in, in the sales. Um, when... There are statistics when people ask, you know, like, how do they feel talking to the Google HomePod or, uh, or the Siri? They actually say they feel they are talking to the real people. And uh, some of them really don't understand how to go back and start texting, looking for something when using this technology. So the technology is really involving, you know, they have uh, a lot of possibilities with that. And... Uh, and those who are interested in using the technology, uh, these are some st statistics, you know, again, Amazon is leading, the Google is the second one, so we are interested in the technology, you go with that one. And the last one, artificial intelligence. So again, everyone is talking, you know, like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, so on, so on. And I was really interesting, does the artificial intelligence already is uh, usable for the marketers? And it actually is, you know, you can show personalized headlines, you can change the content, you can change the visuals in seconds when the artificial intelligence knows has some data to dig about you. So 
for the marketers, you know, 2018 or 2018 looks really fantastic, you know. It's amazing. We have so many technologies and so on. But then is a but. Sorry for that. And I've, I've tried to quote one of the stars from one of my favorite shows. What did Bob used to say? Everything before the word Bob is horseshit. So those we haven't heard, everything before the word but is a horseshit. Why? Why is that? Because... Uh, what did Bob used to say? Everything before... Because this is how the landscape of the technologies in the marketing looks like. You can break a leg here. If you believe there is a single person who understands the marketing technology, how does it work, and what does this thing do, the Ranzo, really, it's, a, it's an amazing. We have so many, uh, and every day there are new ones which are popping up, and you, as a marketer, you are really like stressed, like, what can I do with that? So my solution or suggestion, actual suggestion, you start from the basics, you know, there is like, like I put it on the pyramid, pyramid. if you're going to start your business, you know, start from the basics. First of all, you're talking about the issues you need to, you know, to change, about the pains, uh, what kind of the business you will do, then you have your strategy, what kind of the product you will make, uh, your sales channels, your pricing, etc., etc. Then you go, to, go to the basics. You create your website for fifty dollars. You know, you open your social channels for free. Then you want to do business. You go offline and online. Uh, you know, advertising. And after advertising, you firstly go to the Google Analytics, where you get some data. You know, out of that. When you are feeling fine, you have your business running. You go. You know, with the content marketing, influencers, uh, affiliates, uh, CEO, direct marketing, and so on. And only when you master this, you go with the first marketing automation tool. Select any of them, most of them are great. After you have marketing automation and you master it, all of that, then you go with a small data. I call it small data, I'm not sure is the term for that. But you have a centralized, finally, data management with quite a little bit of the data which you understand. And only then, only then you go with the big data, and when you have the big data, then you plug in, you know, artificial intelligence, you have that machine learning, and finally, artificial intelligence can help you with the predictive analytics. So if you decide to jump somewhere there, you know, don't. I did that three times. Uh, everywhere was a terrible mistake. I don't have time, but I'll give you one example. We had a marketing automation tool maybe installed in, in, in our company two years ago. Again, I was the one like, let's take the marketing automation tool and, and we'll do everything, whatever we can do with it. Um, after about a half of the year, the only thing we could do on that tool was, was sending push notification about promo campaigns. And that was like disgusting even for me, you know, like the only thing I can do with that, send the promo campaigns about 15, you know, percentage discount. So you need a strategy, you need a, you know, a content team to prepare everything, you know, for that tool, for the machine running. You need some KPIs to track what's going on. The next thing what happened, you know, we decided, okay, let's dig some data, you know, inside the automation and let's find our most, um, our most, uh, let's say, loyal users who are using our product the most. So we dig some data and we see, like, we selected the ones who has most connections between application and our product, which is, like, wirelessly connected. And we started, you know, to call them and ask for some treatments and so on. At the end, we figured out that we had some technical issues between our device and the mobile phone, and those connections were the technical issues, like, uh, simply disconnections. So we started calling our most, uh, I don't know, angry persons, you know, angry users who were, ha who were having a lot of disconnection issues. So this was, you know, for us one of the red flags. Okay, guys, we need to relax a little bit with all this automation, with all this, you know, amazing stuff and start from the basics, you know, from the strategies, from the resources, what can we do, from the timing, etc., etc. So, my last one is uh, if you decide to go to the marketing and there will always be, you know, uh, technology available in that, go with the basics, go slowly, go with the basics, because what happens, 
what happens when you are in the business for a few years and you go up and you go up and you go up the bottom part you know is evolving uh, social networks five years ago were simple as that you have video or the image you boost it for the one dollar and you have hundred thousands of the shares now you know everyone is laughing and you need three people inside the company to run a social network so everything is changing you know select few of them go step by step and maybe you will have a success thank you do we have questions or we are leaving questions in the networking part okay now i would like to present a data from the loyal and maybe she will also cover some parts of Rolanda's presentation because she's going to talk about customer loyalty, right? Can they we start are from the beginning, please? <laughs> they are actually ruined. our alumni and we are very happy to have you again here on the stage and in the Atreus business. Thank you very much and thank you, Rolandas, for paving the way that, you know, fintech would not live without martech because you need advertising in order to bring people to your fintech companies. And loyalty is actually one uh, key part of any business as well. So um, try to uh, remember what is the first uh, thought that, you, uh, that comes to your mind when you hear the word loyalty. Did you think about uh, your spouse, your pet? Or did you think about these bad guys that are tearing our wallets and are annoying us every time we are at a point of purchase and need to flick through piles of them in order to find the right one? So let's do a quick test. By raise of hands, who of you have more than two supermarket, uh, competing supermarket uh, plastic loyalty cards? <laughs> Some hands there. What about the drugstores? More than two for drugstores? <laughs> And who of you had to actually pay for those cards? <laughs> Me here. <laughs> so, and the last question is, um, who of you think that retailers should better adjust their pricing models all together and cut out the plastic from our lives? <laughs> because we have them all. In the reality, uh, price wars between retailers have taught consumers to be loyal to one thing, which is price. And that is a very unique situation for Lithuania. Try to imagine a German person walking into our supermarket and being absolutely surprised by all the expiring and damaged products because everything is on sale. In Germany, products are on sale when they are expiring or they are damaged. Here, it's a normal thing, always on. Another couple examples are, um, I was in Singapore and talking to a Singaporean shoe retailer who told me that in the last five years, he had to close seven of the nine of his stores because Amazon Prime is there. And once Amazon one-hour delivery is introduced, he will close the last two stores. Also, some closer examples from Poland, let's say. Four of the biggest food supermarkets are competing on the same third-party uh, marketplace for offers just to add value to every single customer and to try to improve uh, their customer retention. Here in Lithuania, uh, retailers give out the deals, advertise them online, uh, on TV, sorry, and uh, they think that that's, that's it. That's pretty much uh, the whole loyalty done. Uh, but in reality, it's not a sustainable long-term strategy. Uh, at the end of the day, the merchants lose because they spend enormous amounts of money to set up loyalty programs, um, which actually do not add value to the customer, that do not increase loyalty, and that do not uh, influence behavior. So the impact on bottom line is not really existent. Obviously, customers are not happy. You know, we raised hands that we have so many plastic loyalty cards, which is just annoying and inconvenient for us. So do we feel loyal because we own that plastic? Also not really. Those problems that I discussed are more encountered uh, offline. Uh, online is an inherently uh, much more convenient way uh, to foster loyalty, to increase loyalty, to increase comebacks from customers. Um, however, uh, online companies are not competing to the neighbors next door. They are competing on a global scale. And at some point, uh, very convenient delivery times and return policy is not enough to acquire and to retain customers. But why do we care what customers want? 
Because the minute we gave them so many different options for the same product, we made a customer a king. It's normal that customers <laughs> sorry, can, uh, can choose between so many substituting products or services and, you know, uh, it, Obtaining each and every one of them is key for us because supply is not decreasing. Supply of similar products and services is only increasing. And to put things in perspective, uh, it is 80% more expensive to acquire a new customer compared to, uh, you know, attracting uh, to your business existing customer. Uh, existing customers spend 50% more and they bring friends, which is a nice perk. So I am talking about loyalty because I am a co-founder CEO of Offline Loyalty Solution that links uh, all offline deals directly to people's bank cards. So you can register all of your bank cards on DeLoyal, uh, purchase using those bank cards on, uh, at our partner stores offline, and you receive reward points that you can later on spend across all of our partners. So adding liquidity and extreme convenience to consumers. And today I identified, obviously there are so many trends in loyalty, but I wanted to talk to you about three key trends. And first of all, it's product. So if you build a product or product features that in itself fosters loyalty and add value to your customers' lives, you, are, you become a king. That's what Amazon did with its Prime. It's nothing new to ask customers to pay for extra features, but it was a genius solution for Amazon to lock in people to actually prefer purchasing over Amazon to any other means of buying everything from your clothes, your groceries, and even your phone chargers. So essentially, once a customer in New York or London uh, buys Amazon Prime, that's it. That's where they are shopping from that point. Because with one hour delivery times, that's so much hours of your life uh, saved uh, and so much convenience added to your life. The second example, Revolut, <laughs> that's when I become, became actually loyal customer of Revolut um, after you introduced Walt. Because I always wanted to save money, but there was no convenient way to do that until Walt. Now, you know, I purchase and I save every time I spend. So if you add that investment, you know, investment of my saved money, I'm in for a lifetime. <laughs> Um, and those two examples were still online, and, and you would think that it's easy for online to do such things. Um, Sephora is an offline, very much offline, um, health, well, sorry, a beauty product and cosmetics stores. But how they combine their offline sales with online uh, loyalty is just perfect. They have a simple app for collecting and uh, spending points, which is pretty usual, um, but they don't call those points points. At collection, they call them dollars, and at spending, they call them products. They measure um, the points in terms of how many products you can get. Something very simple, but has a lot of impact. On top of that, everything is personalized to the extreme detail. You would only receive free gift samples, free birthday gifts, um, even advices for your skin problems or anything you might have based on your skin type, your product preferences, the money that you want to spend during that month. So actually Sephora's app is no longer a loyalty app. It's your best girlfriend when it comes to uh, healthcare and, and cosmetics products. And something completely very different that has no IT and online and digital involved, but how many IT and digital products could say that their customers has brought cupcakes for their birthday with branded cupcakes, actually. Uh, and that is achieved by a simple thing. That is achieved by a mindset shift from management, where in this service, uh, they would take your car and uh, drop it off where you want it to be dropped off or picked up. They also wash your car if it was dirty, then you left it. And you know that they will never try to um, steal, well, you know, just kind of take as much as possible because sometimes you come to them and they would tell you that this was just a minor thing. We fixed it. You don't need to pay anything. Come back, then you uh, drive 50,000 kilometers more. And that's something then you trust, then you start trusting a business for being very loyal to you. So 
uh, if you manage to uh, build your product or product features around, uh, you know, things that really add value to people's lives, that's basically when you become a king as a business. That's when you know that you locked your customer and they will come back for more. It's especially not cheap to do. Um, it requires a change in perception from management, uh, from the top management, and it's definitely not a short process. It would be strange if I didn't talk about crypto in a fintech conference. Uh, so um, surprise, surprise, loyalty was one of the industries that also took ICOs and crypto by storm and really um, emerged themselves. So these companies are actually um, real existing companies that saw the coherence between crypto points and uh, crypto tokens and reward points um, and uh, decided to test, uh, you know, how that would work. So essentially what blockchain adds to loyalty uh, is two things. First of all, it's full liquidity. A lot of people are dropping, uh, playing loyalty games because they just don't see value in collecting some useless points. With blockchain, all of a sudden, you have full liquidity to do whatever you want with those points. On top of that, you don't need to invest your money in order to have some Bitcoin or, or Ether. So it's actually also very innovative and, and attractive from that perspective. From company side, um, if you use a third party marketplace or loyalty solution, you have to trust their numbers. You have to trust as to how many members they have or numbers that they are reporting. With uh, blockchain, it's all transparent, it's all very measurable and accountable. So um, there are these advantages of using blockchain uh, crypto-based uh, tokens. Obviously, um, if you are familiar with the latest news, the scale of blockchain is not quite there yet. So let's uh, stay up to date on this space. The last one is cooperation. Uh, Amex and Air Miles, British Airways, Virgin have been doing this for ages. They've been trying to look for partners uh, to add more value uh, to people, more liquidity also without the blockchain, um, but essentially so that people can have much more options to spend the collected points. Um, we see this trend happening in Lithuania a lot recently. Well, not recently, but lately. Um, so, Achu Maxima is looking for uh, more partners. Remy is now partnering with um, Neste and Hesburger in order to increase that liquidity, in order to add that value to their customers. Milimausa is one other good example of um, marketplaces, corporations that are happening in Lithuania. However, it's really not an easy thing to do. It requires a lot of negotiation, it requires a lot of uh, political decisions at uh, the top level, which partners to onboard, how the value will be split, and all the rest. So, it's not an easy thing to achieve. And that's where we come in. <laughs> so, Deloyal is a third-party um, marketplace of offers. Essentially, what we do is we take out all the procedures required for setting up your own partnerships. Uh, with Deloyal, any business can uh, join the offline marketplace, loyalty point, uh, offers marketplace and offer their services, offer their uh, products while customers are getting value in return. Couple things to consider uh, regarding the co cooperation and third party marketplaces is obviously the time and resource required to run these programs. And again, um, if you choose to use third party service, a lot of the resource required to run and to analyze data and to manage a uh, customer relationship is done uh, you know, outside of your organization. So a bit about Deloyal, as I mentioned, from a user's perspective, if you register all of your bank cards, regardless of a bank, regardless of a country of the bank, on our app, uh, you can buy things at our partner stores as you normally do with your bank card, and you get reward points. From business perspective, obviously, we make offline purchase data actionable online instantly which is something very unique and very uh, precious for a lot of companies that are trying to evaluate the, ad perform the online advertising cost and ROI when it comes to offline sales. 
Um, and we are offering our product in terms of a marketplace, but also our technology can be used by any company, like let's say Maxima, me and all the others, uh, to um, implement that convenient solution to add value to customers. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. <laughs> Let's give an applause. I think all the questions are staying for the, with the beer. So last but not the least, I would like to invite Sandra here to talk about actually accelerator programs and about what's happening in that area, right? And actually they are starting this project here at Rice Venus next week, right? Right, that's true. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to use any slides because the clicker is not working anyway. <laughs> so I'll just do it like this. Um, first of all, I would like to look uh, back like something like three years. I've been at the conference in Hong Kong. And I was talking to really many people there. And I was telling, okay, we came from Lithuania, blah, blah, blah. And the first question was where this Lithuania basically is and what you do there in your Lithuania. Because no one knew us, like, not only as a fintech nation, basically is like, as anything, and we were just non-existent for the Asians at the world's map. Now the situation really changed a lot. Uh, what we see, uh, like, what was really surprising for us when we launched this application to the FinTech Accelerator, uh, we had maybe eight to ten applications from Canada, apart from other countries. And uh, one time we just like started sending them the emails back like, guys, uh, why on earth you applied to the for the acceleration program in Lithuania? Do you even know where Lithuania is on the map? And they said like, well, yes, basically we know because we heard that Lithuania is some sort of a fintech place in Europe to be. Obviously we've never been there, but we would like to come for the acceleration program, which was really surprising. Uh, the second point, uh, which is really interesting as well, that Asian, uh, like two or three weeks ago, if any Asian corporations were approaching Baltics, they were mostly approaching Estonia, while uh, Estonia like put a lot of efforts in building uh, themselves like as a startup nation of uh, Europe. Uh, nowadays, during the last year, I've really uh, seen many uh, corporations from Japan, from Korea, from Singapore, thanks to the Bank of Lithuania, uh, who are approaching uh, Lithuanian startups and basically uh, try to look at the European start uh, um, Lithuanian startup market, try to find the opportunities uh, to invest in Lithuania. Uh, what's uh, next, like really interesting trend, which we also mentioned during, you uh, noticed during the last two years, is uh, corporates working with startups. Because like uh, for really, really long time, corporates were claiming that they're interested in working with startups. Startups were like claiming that they might be interested in working in company, with companies, but nothing really happened. I mean, it was more than just, you know, branding of some uh, startup batches with some like big name of the corporations. Uh, now, finally, the situation changed, and uh, now companies started realizing that uh, those uh, like startups, they are not just you know something small they can like some sort of a play with. They uh, now see them as like uh, really important market players, and uh, they started finding way working with the, those startups like partnerships, like integrations like uh, bringing them some knowledge from the corporations. And basically talking about like the best way to jump to European fintech market because really many startups now uh, see Lithuania as a gate for the fintech market, of course. And they're asking like, what do we do like in Lithuania, you know, to approach, uh, to get to the market, to approach like the customers, uh, the market players and so on. So uh, what do we suggest, what, what do we offer the startups to do and what do we suggest them to do is, first of all, is uh, building the network. Because uh, Lithuania is not a, a closed community anymore. Uh, by building network in Lithuania, you can easily get to other European markets. Uh, also, we offer them to work with the regulator because uh, I believe that Lithuania is the only country where the re regulator is really open to work with and you can really ask questions and get your answers. 
uh, we do suggest them approaching the corporations because startups like, uh, especially startups from CIS, for example, they are really skeptical, you know, working with the corporations saying like, well, we tried this, but it's mostly like the fiction and uh, now here in Lithuania, it's not happening like this anymore. Uh, because we have uh, several major mar banks, market players, who are launching different program. I mean, really existing program for the startups, and who are really integrating the startups into their banking ecosystems. Uh, in when it comes to again uh, to those banks, for example, uh, Lithuania is a really like good start uh, in terms of you know using banking sandboxes in uh, approaching uh, the bank's customers via the sandboxes uh, because basically uh, like Revolut is on the market, really many new uh, fintech products is on the market in uh, the generation of, for example, younger people are like quite used to work with like new fintech products. They're not afraid to install a new app, they're not afraid to uh, use it for the purchases, for the banking, for whatever. So Lithuania can be some sort of a sandbox market by itself. The product comes to Lithuania and the product uh, is uh, like, and you're trying to approach the users who will be your first and your loyal customers. And, as uh, Dominikas mentioned today about the partnerships and integrations. Uh, we really find this part important uh, because w w how it happened before when uh, there, are different, there were different projects on the market, uh, those projects were competing, not really partnering. Uh, now with the like, technology growing and rising, uh, there is basically the, the, the main uh, value is not the technology itself because to create something like technological device uh, is not a problem anymore. Uh, the main value is the customers. And in this case, by partnering with the different, like with FinTech partnering uh, with each other, uh, you can simply reach more customers and you can simply give your customers some additional values. And that's why basically, uh, that's why basically we created our accelerator. <laughs> Because uh, what we really want to change in this market, we want to, first of all, we're bringing startups from the worldwide, and then we would like the startups to integrate into Lithuanian ecosystem. We would like them to partner with each other, and we would like to make this network uh, even stronger than it is at the moment. So, yeah, that's, I believe that's more or less it. And uh, here in Rise on October 1st, which is going to be on Monday, uh, we are going to make the opening of the program. So there will be some speeches as usual, some like governmental partners, some corporations, some startups. So you're welcome to join. It starts about like seven o'clock. Thank you. So, any questions? My God. Okay, so we still have some beer left. You can stay here, talk a bit, ask questions, and see you next time here at Rice Vilnius. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>